Mod City TV this week is here at Kirk Harper Fine Art. We're here to see the show Chaos and Mayhem with Charmaine Locke and James Searles. The show opens January the 16th and runs through April the 3rd. This show is an incredible body of work from the moment I walked in. I had this eerie feeling that this was sort of what I have been watching on the news, on Facebook, Twitter. It all came together, the, the work by Charmaine, all these red pieces that sort of just evoke pain, suffering, torment, trauma. I think we're all living at some level through this. And here is a body of work that really pulls it all together in a visual display that makes you feel like, wow, somebody's actually brought something that evokes those emotions and feelings that we're all feeling. We'll spend some time talking with Charmaine and James about the show, what it is all about, how it all evolved, how it got started, and get some of the feedback and ideas from them of what this is all about from their perspective. It's a pleasure meeting both of you. Uh, I just watched a show with uh, Johnny Cash and June Carter. I almost feel like I'm in this vibe. <laughs> both great entertainers, uh, musical legends, and I feel like I'm sitting with some art legends. You know, great, uh, you know, years of uh, being together. There's obviously a chemistry, a, a symmetry, or a, um, a feeling and a bond that, that you, you've obviously grown together and evolved. And this show sort of brings it all together at some crazy time and at some crazy level. How did this show get started? Well, Susie one. Khalil uh, has worked with Kirk Hopper and worked with James before um, on shows. And Susie's written quite a bit about James's work. Uh, as I, she became uh, familiar with my first drawing out of this series, Chaos and Mayhem, which was produced end of 19 into the beginning of 20, and I was feeling these vibrations in the culture. Uh, she came to us and said, I think this would be explosive work to show at the beginning of 2021. So she caught you know, caught in and bought into the message and the applicability, as you said, to what's going on. So she picked up that thread and started working on having this exhibit, curating all the work. And we kept working throughout the year on the drawings, on the sculpture, and um, here it is. Here it is. It's, you know, obviously my background in, in, in sculpture and just knowledge, obviously I'm very familiar with your work, James. And when I walk in and I see a sculpture with crosses, I'm sort of not surprised. I mean, it's in the vein of what you normally work in, but it has just a totally different feel. Where did that evolve from and what did it evoke for you? Mm -hmm. Well, there's two <clears throat> in the show with crosses, plus the third one is Charmaine's piece, uh, The Unholy Warrior uh, Blood Feud. Uh, it also has a cross. So there's actually three artworks with crosses as a reality. The one when you first walk in <clears throat> is uh, a double cross on top of a steeple-esque shape. That steeple shape is kind of an elongated, um, you know, a, a of the alphabet, the early alphabet, just a pyramid, that, that shape. It's on top of a steeple and it's leaning, it's falling. It's called falling steeple. Um, a steeple that's falling is, um, that, that's a pretty heavy statement. I mean, that's a, that's a real punch kind of statement, a falling steeple. Because steeples maintain a certain sense of reverence in the community. They're aspiring, they're aspirations, they're pointing to the heavens. You know, they're, um, 
they have a very positive kind of aura about them uh, in terms of his, the historical context. But at the same time, what do you do if you feel, dare I say, uh, the church has, in a sense, fallen somewhat? I, I think they have. I think we've been double-crossed, in a sense, in terms of what uh, where, where they are right now. You know, I mean, if I am asking, and I grew up a Baptist, let me, let me put that on the table. This is like me dealing with my own, you know, this is not something that is outside of my force field, so to speak. Um, I, I, I think I kind of have, in one sense, earned the right to make the comment, come on, church, where are you? What are you doing? What do you stand for right now? Are you living up to your aspirations, your stated aspirations? That's a pretty... Who's asking that question? You know, I mean, uh, as an artist, that's, that's what I'm asking. And I think our times demand that, to tell you the truth. It may be that we demand that in our life on a daily basis, but as a community, as a big picture kind of, uh, you know, all, all across the country. You know, this is not just a right here question. It's a, it's a serious question. And I think all of the art in this exhibition, Charmaine's and, and mine as well, uh, carry that kind of deep personal vision with it. Um, I think that's the nature of what you felt when you walked in. Charmaine, this obviously is a body of work that started in 2019. I don't know, it's sort of visionary um, that this is sort of where the vibrations of the world found you mm -hmm. and, and you started seeing and, and creating something in sort of a body of work that um, it's interesting, the names of the pieces, Chaos and Mayhem, The Uncivil War, The Fallen Ones, The Unholy War, mm -hmm. War and Origins. Tell us a little bit about sort of the common thread between all the pieces mm. and, and how they evolved. Well, I really just got back into my studio um, at that period brought out a sheaf of paper of similar size material and decided, made that conscious decision that this was going to be directed to um, our move away from the aspiration that James is talking about. So we share a lot of ideas. We don't share a studio but our processes, but we share ideas and concepts and philosophy and bounce those back and forth. So we, my sense of society as being for human flourishing, for tolerance, and seeing that starting to be chipped away and feeling that as an actuality in our culture in 2020 into 2021 and now you know really crashing through at this moment but uh, throughout the year just feeling the tension the tumultuous quality of our world I don't ignore it I pay extra attention to it so the red was giving it a passionate sense of um, that dynamic sense of what's going on in people's lives it's not theoretical, it's in people's daily lives, and so how to address this, and um, that we must look at it, that we must pay attention, and by that we can start to reclaim it as time goes by. Not quickly, but... So the pieces of paper got laid out and get given a base, and then just intensive work over the course of the months. I kept going back to the next one and the next one, and ideas spawned out of the one that I just completed, and it really did flow very well. So, interestingly enough, how you know your 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 background is in in psychology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
that must have some bearing on your thought process. I think so. I think throughout my work that's been a primary um, source of ideas is looking at people and thinking about their motivations, which is psychology, studying human motivation, what brings them to a point of action one way or the other, and then studying history and sociology as well, how people relate in groups to groups and throughout history how humans have solved their problems. A lot of conflict. They choose to solve it with a lot of conflict and some fairly um, horrific solutions have come up. So again, this is looking at the truth. James, obviously your career spans years being a professor at SMU. Sculpture flows through your blood. Um, when you look at cockfight and bloodbone, were those pieces ever in your mind that you thought, you know, this is something, or has it just evolved over time? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we, we, Charmaine and I have discussed a lot, you know, does art move through you? You know, if you're the conduit, then you have to be receptive. <clears throat> if you're receptive, what are you receptive to? If you're receptive to those things that have played a role in your life, in your early life, in your middle life, and your, you know, they, they're, they're personal. Uh, they really become a, a personal kind of uh, thing. And <clears throat> I, I can't divorce myself from the reality of the, the male and the male is about a cockfight, you know. I mean, it's a rooster. Okay, it's a rooster. It's a bird. But it's guys handling the birds and shaving the birds' cones and putting spurs on them and, you know, gearing them up, gladiating, gladiating uh, the, the rooster, you know, making it go out there and do this. And it's an extension. And I don't know that it, I can deny the fact that the extension uh, is in me as well. I am a male, and I am a, you know, I'm, I'm a male. I, I can't divorce myself from that. <clears throat> but it also, I have consciousness, and consciousness then can bring the metaphor for the for the for cockfight as a concept. You know, it's a thing over here. I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to participate. I've made a conscious decision to move into other realms. You know, but boy, you see it. You see it. You know, and uh, Charmaine and I were driving from Austin over to uh, Splendora to our place in Splendora. So it's three hours on the road. And we were bombarded with uh, pickup trucks with flags and blowing, rolling, what's called rolling smoke. They're diesels where they'll roll out the smoke in your face. And that's a, ha, ha, ha. It's sort of the big man, you know, syndrome. And uh, it's fairly repulsive, just to be honest with you. And I have seven daughters, so I think about it a lot. You know, this is not a new subject. Uh, it's it's a very prevalent subject. But Charmaine has always been one of the psychological nature of something personal in your immediate life. You know, that's that is her wheelhouse, and she brought that wheelhouse into mine. So our two rotating forces. Uh, really moved into the same realm, you know. It's like, it may be far-fetched, but nevertheless, I look at it like uh, you can prove that light is a wave. Okay, it's a wave. You can also prove it's matter, you know. You can, you can prove, you can prove that. And how can something be two things at once? Well, they can, you know, and you can be independent, which we are, 
our art doesn't really look alike. You know, it doesn't look alike. But there is a prevailing feel, a thread that's woven through it, you know, that makes it um, very co psychologically compatible, you know, to show in a collective sense. So we do, you know, we, but we think about it. It's, this is on purpose. Charmaine, the, the sculpture Unholy Warrior, Blood Feud, mm -hmm. it evokes some weird feelings when I'm looking at that piece. Obviously, the, 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 the one part of it that, that emanates the most for me is the cross. Because mm -hmm. it just doesn't seem to fit, but it does fit. Mm -hmm. How did that one evolve? Well, from the drawing, the sculpture really started with the drawing, and um, in the, again, in the context of the series, the nature of what humans do to um, conquer. You know, first, survival but then going beyond to overwhelm other people with your concept and your belief system strikes <coughs> me as really <coughs> unfathomable to the, the degree to which the Crusades or contemporary times were still carrying out that battle, that specific uh, philosophical battle, and at the cost of human lives. And when it destroys whole cultures, it becomes questionable to such a degree that it brings about a level of um, rage that people's lives are destroyed at the cost of these overriding concepts. So obviously the people involved in those conflicts are filled with this, what you see in the piece, this aggressive conquering mentality that drives particularly men if we look through history, there's a few women that stand out. We could name Joan of Arc or, you know, this one, that one. Primarily men that carry out that act of war and aggressive transgression. So I had to speak to it. I just felt this was the time. It, it, it is, it just feels every bit of what you're explaining, you know, just this, this the, these words, of the times this week <laughs> um it just feels what what you know the show is and it's unbelievable in my mind that i'm sitting here and i'm i'm looking at work that really evokes just this this craziness mm -hmm. for the lack of a better term because it is craziness we're living in in a country and being an immigrant this is not what i ever expected it to be so um the the, the show evoke so many emotions um, but one of the things that, that highlights in the show beyond all the pain and suffering and is the Houston suite James this is a beautiful body of work on its own right <laughs> talk a little bit about what that is and and what it means and 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 how it was created because there's a name for the paper uh, I, I, I hope see something like that. So tell yeah. us a little bit about it. Yeah, I can't, I can't even pronounce the name of the paper now, to tell you the truth. Um, I, think, I think in one sense, art is made in a body. You, you make a body of work, you know, and certainly Charmaine just described her drawings. Her, 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 this, this is a body of work that's been put together from this time to this time. And it sort of really, really focuses on the thinking that's going on during this time is, is really producing, uh, you know, some intensive, what I call thinking thought. Um, these are the same way. These, these were ma uh, made really from uh, being in the woods, in the Splendora woods. I mean, we have close to 200 acres that's you know, deep, like East, East Texas forest. And it's beautiful to walk in. And we've spent years walking in it, seeing the canopy and the sunlight coming through, feeling the moistness of the, those leaves that you walk on, you know, the <clears throat> when it's wet or dry uh, or early or late, 
the woods produce a certain kind of inherent sense in, in you. Uh, people always have a, an, an incredible experience being in the forest. There's hundreds of books <laughs> written about the subject, as a matter of fact. So these are from that, you know, I mean, these, these pieces come uh, from that. But entwined, there's one that's called Father Rabbi. Father Rabbi, and it's a, it's a priest and a rabbi that's shown as one, you know, and I, I kind of want to go on record here as saying that having grown up within the confines of uh, a church community, you know, that um, I, I found a lot of good there. You know, I can't look back and say, oh, my whole entire childhood was horrible because of the church. Well, that's not the case. You know, I mean, that was a, a shared sense of communal belonging, mm -hmm. you know, and, and really uh, has played historically a big role, you know. But they do profess to have certain values. They do profess profess to believe in certain things. And there are at least stated psychological lines that you do not cross within the confines of that belief. You know, so you're, you're holding something sacred there. And it is the sacredness of it, I think, that it gets flawed periodically by just the human condition, just the human, the human evolutionary development has saw to it that that chaos can kick in, you know, it may flow in a hundred year, two hundred year flow chart through history, but it's there and we're in one, you know, we just so happened we are deeply embedded in one. And I think this may very well be a time when we should say, you know, somebody needs to I don't know how else to put this, but kind of confess their sins and step up and accept their shame as to what they have espoused and believe and support it and support it. It's important for us as a community to say, here's what we support. Here's what we are. Here's what we stand for. Here's the meaning of our existence. And I think the... I, 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 I'm telling you, I think we've been kind of double-crossed in a sense. I mean, that's pretty. That's putting it pretty bluntly. That's that's a heavy phraseology to use. They're, oh well, they've double-crossed us, you know. But in a sense, they they really have, you know. Uh, and I I just thought that was a way of expressing it. Um, this show this show is very important for for me personally. You know, it's. 99.9% .9 all wood, and wood is what started me in the, I started with wood, you know, I was a wood carver, you know, and that's kind of chopping wood on the East Texas rural route is kind of what got me into my adulthood. And I have taken what I did in my youth, Just I just did it, I grew up doing it. So it made sense, you know, that... Uh, I would become an artist. I just I get to live a creative life, and Charmaine, to tell you the truth, gives that creative life some direction, and some meaning, and some content. And I, I guess by definition, we can all say that about family. That's a family thing, you know. But uh, we didn't we didn't move to New York. We didn't go to Soho. You know, we didn't go join the ranks of the, the ones that, you know, had to go seek their fortune. You know, we sought our fortune in the woods, you know, in the garden, you know, with little kids. And uh, it was a different kind of, uh, you know, personal world. But it does, it, it did, it still does, issue a challenge to us. We're both challenged in that sense that we, we feel the need to express some personal 
values and statements. And that's what this art does. In finality, is that what you would expect people to get from the show? Well, now, if you're asking me that, I will tell you that I have found that people get kind of what they bring to the table. <laughs> you know, they'll they'll come and they'll they'll quite literally paste their view over yours, and they'll say, and and I've heard it said a thousand times. Oh, it can mean whatever the spectator wants it to mean. Well, that may have been true in the abstract expressionist world. You know that you could in, make your interpretation and. It could be whatever you wanted. But our art's made with an intent. It's actually made with a purpose. It's not that it is architecturally rendered, you know, in that finite way. It, is, it maintains a serious degree of expression. You know, you're expressing, but you're expressing with a direct intent to make a statement. Unholy warrior, blood feud, that's on purpose. You know, that didn't just show up by splashing a bunch of stuff together. That had to be rationally, consciously, systematically, intuitively thought out. You know, and... We used to use the term message. There is a message there. How, how pe And the title accents that and gives access to the viewer. But they frequently will come up with something very much from their own personal experience, which is understandable, but sometimes way different than I thought I was intending. So there is that dual um, interpretive dance of the viewer with the art, and they take away their personal version, which is great. And that's what an art show is supposed to do. It's, a, it's an experience. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the, the key takeaways for me is the fact that when, when someone walks into a show like this, I think the greatest gift I had was spending time with you and, <coughs> and understanding what the show is. Because if you don't, you can get lost and you can't be uh, guided in your own thoughts to make the decision <coughs> of what it is. But it's, it, it, unfortunately, this term it, it, it cannot be described as, as a beautiful show. It is a real show. It's realistic. It's of the times. Uh, I, I think it's monumental in scope. And I thank you for your time. I appreciate you giving me the time to chat with you and, and learn a bit more about the show and, and about the two of you. And I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with you. Thanks. And you can see the show here at Kirk Hopper through April the 3rd at 1426 North Riverfront Boulevard in the Dallas Design District. Or you can visit them on their website at kirkhopperfineart.com.